these guys are doing is actually a, a module, which is a final year module that if you come here, you will all do, um, which is a computational analysis module. Uh, and what are they doing? They're using SolidWorks. Uh, and currently, they, they are modelling a quarter of this of a piston. It's a bigger piston than this because it's a marine piston, so it's about, about 600 mil diameter, uh, that big. But essentially, it's, it's very similar to, to this piston. Okay. And so what, what they're doing, um, because this piston is symmetrical, we can just produce a, a model of a quarter of this piston and we can do analysis on it. And we can use a technique called finite element analysis where we take this as a continuous structure and we break it down into small elements so that we can understand mathematically the response of each of these elements. We put it all together and we can analyse the structure. Okay. So what, what they're currently doing is, is this project where they're looking at the thermal performance of this piston, so we're looking at temperature distributions, and a stress analysis where they're looking at the thermal stresses, at the stresses due to the uh, pressure loading on the firing stroke, and the inertia stresses. Uh, and then ultimately, because it, what, what I've given them to do is an old piston, uh, that's a lot too big and heavy, and heavier than it should be. Um, they're going to do some optimization then and to uh, redesign that piston to uh, reduce its mass and hence its inertia. So you can see that's quite a good example of the, of the model. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in here we run a variety of software. We run SolidWorks. For level seven, we run a package called ANSYS, um, which is a, a more advanced analysis package. We've got about 200 machines in the school uh, that are dedicated to house our software. Uh, and we have a replacement policy that we replace each machine. We never have a machine more than three years old, basically. That, that's in addition to the general university's machines, like on the, as I was mentioning earlier, on the third floor and at the library, etc. This is the um, manufacturing lab. We've all talked earlier about um, design and the use using SolidWorks to make these wonderful shapes. But how do you make things and how do you manufacture things? And this is what we do down here. So you've drawn your model, you've drawn your, 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 what you want to make in SolidWorks. You've got to produce, um, manufacture it. And one of the things we have here is a thing called computer-aided manufacture. And we use a software called EdgeCam. So what you can do with your SOLIDWORKS drawing is convert that to a file that a CNC machine, a computer controlled machine, can manufacture. So it goes through, you send your files from CAD to CAM, Computer Daily Manufacture, and they convert the files to, to something that these machines understand. Then you could send that file to anywhere in the world, providing that machine reads that code, it can be manufactured. A lot of things that with design is you, you, you produce a design and it looks great on a 2D screen. So you've got a, a PC there with it and it looks fantastic and it's just what we wanted. You don't get any perception of scale and you don't get any perception of depth on a 2D screen. So what we can do here, I think, called rapid prototyping. And it's basically 3D prototyping. And we can produce components very quickly overnight, for example and have them in our hand in the morning. And what does that mean to us? Well, as designers or engineers, we can have a look at it and go, well, actually, is it doing what we want it to do? Is it put in the right shape? Is it ergonomically correct? Or you could be taking it to a customer and saying, is that what you wanted? And he might go, well, actually, no. Or actually, yes, but maybe we can make this improvement or it's perfect. So these allow us to produce these very, very quickly. What this machine does is, is lay, put a layer, a very, very fine layer of material down at one level and then comes back and does a second layer and then comes back and does a third layer. So we can produce very integrate components like that. There's a, an engine block, a V6 engine block. How else would you make that? That's um, a rock with um, obviously the stairs inside. You just physically couldn't make these components without this technology. And the Formula One teams now are actually laying alloys and that steel down, alloy steel down. The other thing that's sort of actually happened is that we actually had a CAT scan of somebody's hand and 
that's the form material to form it. There's the CAT scan and there's the bone structure of somebody's hand. And Tony uh, was telling me, uh, really interesting the other day, or some, a couple of days ago, that um, there's a lot more work going on with the medical side now. A, a, a lady had um, bo bone cancer in her face, so they took a CAT scan of the, of the other side of her face, mirrored it, and they formed all the bone structure using rapid prototyping. Redid, reformed her face and then apparently the, the bone structure rebuilds across the rapid prototyping and reformed her face. Does anyone know anyone who's had a, a ball joint in their knee or every, every, most people now, it's quite common isn't it? I've had a hip, my, my father-in-law's had a hip and a knee. So they're all engineered by engineers, you know, all the materials etc. So there's a big area of, that, of engineering and that. If our man now runs towards this machine as fast as he can, probably only came once. Okay, so it stopped, was it? How did it know? It's got light sensors, thank you. It's got um, light sensors here, which is a light curtain which stops this machine. Now that's industry. If you go to Jaguar, they have big uh, compounds with interlocks. Um, so it's, again, Various modules use this for um, teaching, certainly at level six, where you do any robotics or control uh, subjects. And as, as I say, an MSc student, what you do is quite different. We've shown you how CNC computer controlled equipment, and it's all very clever and it's fantastic to use, and it's, you know, it's, it's cutting, cutting edge stuff. But ultimately, you still need to know how to um, cut metal and make, shit, make things. Now, does anyone do metal work in school? I didn't even do woodwork. <laughs> yeah. well, I did, when I went to school, I did metalwork, and everyone used to make a, a coffee table with one leg short of the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But students don't do that now, they don't have the opportunity. So every a mechanical student, level four, first year, spends six days in here making things. Um, we make what we call a paperweight. It's basically a, 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 a dice mounted on a base. And what it teaches you to do using a milling machine is how to square up, how to mark out, how to drill and tap. And juice that, that and everyone produces one of those. And we've got thousands of these laying about in various plates and disciplines. You have to take it away when you've finished. Yeah. The, the point is not to get you to make a dice or a paperweight. The point is to show you the process of how you put that and produce. Odd lead calipers, they're used for scribing a, a parallel line on a piece of steel or a piece of wood. Um, they're made out of high carbon steel. It allows us to show you, demonstrate, thing called hardening and tempering, where we can make this tough but not brittle. And the idea behind that is, you can talk all day long in lectures about how, what you're doing to the structure of the material. There's nothing like holding it under the flame and putting it in oil, quenching oil, etc. So, there are practical things as well. So, you spend six days in semester one in here. Um, in these processes. How much is a spark plug? 10? 10 quid, is it? Like that. 10 to 12 pounds. This one's about 3,000 pounds. And what it is, is it's a spark plug, works in the same way. It has uh, two electrodes, then it sparks, ignites the fuel, turns the fuel, and reduces the power. It has um, a, a little hole in there that's a pressure sensor, and we can, that allows us to do is measure the pressure in the cylinder of the engine. With some clever trickery and some other sensors, including a crank angle sensor, we can actually produce what they call a pressure volume diagram. And that will give us the actual indicated work that that piston sees in the cylinder of the engine. And quite a clever thing to do. And from that, we can put a complete performance map, engine map on that engine. We can load it up put it under load. We can measure the fuel going in, the air going in. All these things cost money. And we can actually change the, the engine mapping if so desired. So what do you think the exhaust temperatures are going to be on full power on that engine? And think about it, when, it, when you think about it, the, the engine, the exhaust manifold is made of steel and the, 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 mate, the, the, the melting process, uh, temperature for steel is about 1200. Is it? So how hot do you think the engine is going to get exhaust? Well, you want it to melt, do you? gets to around 920, 930 degrees C. So when we're running that on full load, that's glowing white. So next time you're driving down the motorway and you're in the fast lane in your 1.1 Corsa, 
doing 90 when you should only be doing 70. Mm. Yeah. Imagine what's going on under that bonnet. Because that, um, I think maximum power is about four and a half, five thousand RPM. So it's roughly what you'll be doing at 90 miles an hour. My wife does it all the time. <laughs> I mean, you don't, nobody understands what's going on under the bonnet, do they? We've also, uh, the yellow thing over there looks a bit like a wind tunnel. It's actually a wind tunnel. So we can do <laughs> um, tests on... Uh, wings. Anything like wings. I can show you how a plane actually flies. I can show you stall, etc. Uh, and there's other things around. There's, there's um, air conditioning units that we can show you how an air conditioning, the cycle, the true cycle, how it actually works and what it's doing, rather than it's just getting cold and it's nice to. Please believe it not, it's going to be on the track next week. The reason it's in. A, a, a disassembled state is that last Sunday we were testing at Aintree Race Sports, there's an automotive racetrack there. You know, they used to run the motor at the British Grand Prix at Silver, uh, Aintree in the 60s. We tested it on Sunday, didn't we? And uh, it went away to paint on Monday, so they had to strip it overnight and strip it down to its burbines. It's been uh, chrome at uh, Stove Enamelers, and now they're starting to rebuild it. And for the launch for the car on Friday, we'll have the unveiling on Friday. It has one more test to do, hopefully this weekend, just to shake down, and then it goes to Silverstone on Wednesday for the event. Um, it's a Honda CBR 600 RR engine, and, um, breathing through a 20 mm stripper as part of the rules, um, but it's still knocking out about 85 brake horsepower. And you're looking at 0 to 60s, 3.5, 7. The first car we built, this is the third one. The first one we built was about 280, 280 kilo, which is still light, isn't it? Last year's was 237. We were hoping it was about 218. We all had a sweep of hand in each eight, 228. So There's the nose coming off it. This is last year's car. Um, and this is at the actual event last year. The simulator we bought this year is a 360 degree simulator, so if you, if you call it a toy to Christian, he'll probably come out and kill you. But what he's trying to do is, what we can do with it is we can download the characteristics of various types of cars, including our own, and then it can simulate driving. You notice that it moves as the car moves, and when he puts his foot on the brake, you'll see a, a nose dive. It's the only one, the only one that does the three minutes. He's off the track now and into the barrier. <laughs> <laughs>